Okay, tonight we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about biological carters. We're going to talk about networks for life and what you might do to help stitch the world together again because we have fragmented an awful lot of it. But before we do that, let's lay a little background. This is a fecal sac. Um, you know, birds, particularly well, any nesting bird, has babies that that poop in the nest, and you can't can't allow that very much. So. The, the feces comes out in a discreet little sack and the parents pick it up and they fly out and they drop it. <clears throat> so there are animals out there that have started to mimic fecal sacs because nobody wants to eat a fecal sac. Fecal sac. And this is one of them. It's, uh, it's always on the top of a leaf, looks like a fecal sac. It's actually a bola spider. Um, and it in the nighttime, it looks like a real spider. It, it hangs down from a leaf. Uh, but it doesn't do what a real spider does. Real spiders, well, it is a real spider, but most spiders spin a web. Uh, and of course, that's what catches flying insects. These guys don't do that. They have a, a single strand of silk and put one sticky glob of glue at the end there. <clears throat> uh, and that's what they go fishing with. They hope that a moth comes by and gets caught on that. And moths do come by and get caught on that, believe it or not. They wrap them up very quickly. Um, immobilize them in silk, and then they feed on that body. And when they're through with it, they'll cut it loose and they'll go fishing again and catch another moth. And they'll do that again until they have enough energy to make a an egg mass. So this is a silken egg mass. All the eggs are in the center there. It's decorated on the bottom and it will stay there in the entire winter and then hatch in the following spring. And if they fed it on enough moths, they can make two or three egg masses. Uh, so you might wonder why a moth is flying into a single strand of silk. You would think a web would be a much better way of catching things, but actually it's not accidental. This, this is a female bola spider and she's releasing the sex pheromone uh, that attracts males of particular species of moths. And as you move around the country, the, the species of moths differ, but at my house, it turns out it is the bronze cutworm. And I learned that by unwinding the, the bodies that she has caught and, and they're all bronze cutworms. And I've got brown cutworm at, at my house because, and I've got bronze cutworm caterpillars because I've got golden rye, that's her primary host plant. Also have this uh, beautiful moth, the dot line white, because I've got oak trees, particularly white oak trees, and because I don't rake the leaves away from those trees. There is a dot line white uh, cocoon in these leaves. And I'll bet you can't see it. It's right there. And a close up there. There's no way you would see that when it goes time, comes time to rake your leaves. Uh, so that's what you're raking away when you rake your leaves. You're raking away all the things that have pupated in those leaves. You're also raking away the ground cover that that uh, those leaves are protecting. I have evening primrose moths at my house because I've got evening primrose. I've got evening primrose because I planted it. And the moths come. They spend the day with their head stuck in the flower. Sometimes it's crowded in there, but it's always very cute. I've got uh, zebra swallowtails because I've got pawpaws. And I've got pawpaws because I planted them. Our house didn't used to have any of that stuff. It would take me a long time, at least a week, to describe all the species that now are making a living at, at our house because of the plants we've put there. It would not take me very long to describe all the life that is in a typical suburban yard. Uh, they don't have goldenrod, so they don't have bronze cutworms, so they don't have bola spiders. They don't have oak trees, so they don't have dot line whites. They don't have evening primrose, so they don't have the evening primrose moth. They don't have pawpaws, so they don't have swallowtails. And that's what a typical suburban yard looks like. We've got 135 million acres of typical suburban uh, landscapes. They're dominated by non-native plants, and they're not supporting any of those interactions. Uh, and that's why we're seeing some pretty scary headlines these days, like the insect apocalypse is here, we're talking about global insect decline. North America's lost 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. It's a third of our North American bird population already gone. Two thirds of the Earth's wildlife is already gone. The UN says we're going to lose a million species to extinction in the next 20 years, as if that's an option. 40% of the Earth's plants face extinction. Now that's why Elizabeth Colbert gets to write a book about the sixth great extinction event, which is, uh, we've had five other extinction events. None of them have been pretty. This one's not pretty either, but this is the first one being caused by uh, a single species, and that is us. People are reacting. There's so much reaction to, to biodiversity loss that some people are actually studying it. Uh, and Richard Hobbs thinks that our reaction to biodiversity loss follows very closely the five stages of grief we experience when we learn that we have a, a terminal disease. First, there's denial. 
Uh, and there's certainly a lot of denial out there. A lot of people say we don't have any problems at all. Um, anger, I felt a little bit of that. Bargaining, well, what can we do to, to, to make it a little bit better? Depression, I felt a little bit of that too. And then the final stage is acceptance. It's where I'm going to push back because acceptance is equivalent to giving up uh, on biodiversity loss. And that's not an option because losing nature is not an option. We are here on this planet because of the natural world. So I'm gonna post a, propose a sixth stage and that would be action. What we can actually do to fix these problems. Now we do have parks, we do have preserves. Our national parks in particular were established primarily because they were gorgeous places. They had exquisite scenery. And Teddy Roosevelt did a lot of that and he described his, his motivation. The establishment of the National Park Service is justified by considerations of good administration. So Teddy was patting himself on the back there, as he should, of the value of natural beauty as a national asset and the effectiveness of outdoor life and recreation in the production of good citizenship. Translation is that our parks were created because they were pretty places for us to play in. They were not created for conservation. Consequently, we only have 3.6% of the U.S. and national parks, and only 12% is federally protected, which means 88% is not protected. Uh, and what's happening in that 88% is appalling. I mean, you've heard many of these statistics before, but every 30 seconds, a football field worth of America's natural areas disappears to development. Development, the most oxymoronic word in, in all of conservation We've got 44 million acres of lawn now. That's an area bigger than the size of New England. We have already paved over an area larger than Ohio with concrete, with macadam. And that's a 15-year-old statistic. So you know it's bigger than that. Two million acres of golf courses in the U.S. And that's an area larger than Rhode Island and Delaware combined. So you might wonder why uh, the parks and preserves that we have are not not good enough. Why aren't they sustaining the biodiversity that we need? <clears throat> and the simple answer is they're too small. When you take a large area like this and you shrink it down to a small little isolated patch, and that's an exaggeration, but you're taking large populations and shrinking them down to small populations. And that's the problem. Small or tiny populations are highly vulnerable to local extinction. Why? Because all populations fluctuate. In good times, they go up, and bad times, times they go down. If you're a large population like this top line here, even in your down cycle, there's still a lot of individuals so that you can increase quickly when times get better. But if you're a tiny population and you undergo this normal fluctuations, and again, all populations do, you often hit zero. You blink out of your little habitat patch and then you're permanently gone. And unless you can recolonize, that's called local extinction. And picture a, a box turtle or, or a salamander or something crossing a major highway. It just doesn't happen. There's studies all over the world, and some of them are quite lengthy, more than a century in, in length, uh, that are telling us our natural areas are not large enough to sustain the amount of nature that we need to sustain us. Now, we tend to use extinction as a metric of trouble. You know, when an animal's close to extinction, then we, we get concerned, but not before that. Um, I don't think it's the right metric. Extinction, that's like going to the doctor when you're dead. It's not going not gonna to help at that point. Uh, we really need to be concerned about what was once common, the species that were once common and are disappearing. And the, the American chestnut is a perfect example. It was the dominant tree from Maine all the way to Georgia along the crest of the Appalachians. Um, Rusty patch bumblebee used to be one of the most common uh, bumblebees in the country. And used to, I mean, I'm talking about 15 years ago, not that long ago. It's now on the brink of extinction. Beavers. Beavers determined the hydrology of the entire country before we essentially wiped them out. Now, they're still here and they're actually making a comeback, but not nearly at the level at which they were here once when they actually controlled the hydrology of all of our streams and rivers. So we're talking about not extinction, but defaunation, the reduction in abundance of populations, particularly populations of common species, because they are the ones that run our ecosystems. That's the real problem. It's local, it's everywhere. And surprisingly, we don't even notice it. We don't even notice it because of what we call shifting baseline. We tend to think that the world uh, is right the way it was when we were growing up. So if we're born in an area, in an era where a lot of species are already gone, we don't know that they belong there. We don't miss them. 
um, and, and we think it's okay. Nobody, for example, is missing the pa uh, passenger pigeon. It was the most common bird in the entire globe, uh, but we, it was gone before any of us were, were born, so we don't miss it. So shifting baseline means that we're losing biodiversity uh, over, over periods of decades, and it's the biodiversity that sustains us, and most of us don't even notice it. Now, Chris, if we don't notice it, we don't do anything about it. We have to do something about it. What shall we do? Uh, well, um, it's gotten a lot of attention. You know, we, the UN met this year in Canada, uh, had a big meeting uh, to talk about what we're going to do about, about biodiversity. Uh, you know, the UN is is fine. It's doing the best it can. Um, but this was a headline coming from that meeting. Crucial negotiations to protect biodiversity are moving at a snail's pace. Um, so we're, we're negotiating about whether or not we're going to protect the nature that actually keeps us alive on this planet. I'm not going to put a lot of faith in, in the UN. Um, E.O. Wilson thought a lot about this. Uh, he, of course, is a very famous professor at, at Harvard. He died the day after Christmas two years ago. Uh, extremely long and productive career, over a 60-year career at, at uh, Harvard. And throughout that very long career, he was concerned about, about uh, nature, about biodiversity. Uh, he wanted to save it, not just because he loved it, but because he knew it was essential to our own survival. So in 2016, he wrote this book, Half Earth, Our Planets Fight for Life. Uh, and he had one simple, one simple uh, idea, and that was a very bold idea, but it was simple. We have to, if we're going to save life anywhere on planet Earth, we have to save nature. We have to save functioning ecosystems on at least half of the planet. Otherwise, it's going to disappear everywhere. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that very bold statement. And then he ended the book. He didn't tell us how we were going to save nature on half of planet Earth. Of course, to a conservation biologist, that sounds great. We'll just put half the Earth aside and uh, all the species that are disappearing can be in there and, and it'll be great. But half of planet Earth is already in some form of agriculture, and we have 8 billion people in the other half, along with all of our, our roadways and detritus and airports. Uh, and we don't have a third half to put aside for nature. So how can we actually realize E.O. Wilson's dream? I think we can. I think we can. But we need a new approach to conservation in order to do that. We're going to have to give up the idea that, that humans and nature cannot coexist. That's the way we've been proceeding uh, for forever. Uh, we've had humans here and nature someplace else. There is no someplace else for nature these days. So now if we're going to save the nature that we absolutely need, we're gonna have to save it where we are. A lot of people think it's not possible to live with nature. I'm gonna argue that not only is living with nature an option, it is now the only viable option that's left to us. So we need to explore it and figure out how to do it. In the past, of course, conservation has worked pretty much exclusively where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head and we need to practice conservation where there are a lot of people because that's pretty much everywhere. So we're not just gonna do conservation in, in areas like this, we have to do it here, which means we're gonna have to rebuild it. I mean, this is a dead zone. We've got to rebuild nature where we live, where we work, where we play, and even where we farm. And that means we've got to find ways for nature to thrive in human-dominated landscapes. That is the challenge of our, our times. Not hang on by a thread, but thrive. So here's the problem. We've fragmented the natural world into tiny little, little viable habitats, little remnants of what used to be here. In between those remnants is no man's land. Um, so what's been proposed, of course, is to build biological carters. We're going to build uh, enough habitat so that plants and animals can move back and forth between these viable habitats. Uh, it's designed for plants and animals to move, not to live in. Um, I don't think that's enough. I don't think that's enough, but we've got to expand those carters into actual viable habitats. So that's better. That's even better. So what are these light areas here? That's where our cities and our, our farms are, but all the other places have to be, particularly our riparian carters, have to be viable habitat so that the, the essential size of these tiny fragments is much bigger. They're not fragments anymore, they're connected. And that means when populations fluctuate, which they always do, the, the species won't blink out in them anymore. That's the goal. So to achieve this, we, we need a new attitude about property rights because you're talking about practicing conservation outside of parks and preserves. 
And every bit of part conservation we do outside of a, a preserve helps conservation inside that preserve. But what's outside the preserve is private property. So we need to re rethink what we're, we're uh, I mean, right now we've got the idea of property rights. We can do whatever we want on, on our property. Um, what we have to realize though, is that our piece of property is part of the earth, which is part of the entire global series of ecosystems. And what we do on our property affects everything else. So our yards are not like Las Vegas. You know, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. We all understand that. But what happens in our yards does not stay on our yards. What happens in our yards ecologically affects everybody and everything else around us. <clears throat> Again, because your property is part of a local ecosystem. So whatever you do on it does impact the entire ecosystem. Let's use uh, uh, lawn as an example. The amount of lawn that you have on your property is going to determine a number of things. It's going to determine whether you get stormwater runoff or whether the rain infiltrates and recharges your water table. It's going to determine whether you're adding nitrogen and phosphorus and herbicides and insecticides to your local watershed. Because you can't have a lawn like this without doing that. <clears throat> it's going to determine how much carbon you're adding to the atmosphere every time you mow it, which is once a week. How you landscape is going to determine whether you're supporting the pollinators that we all need or whether you're eliminating the resources that they need. How we all landscape is going to determine how much carbon our property is pulling out of the atmosphere. Remember, plants build their tissues out of carbon. Uh, and once they do that, they, they uh, pump the extra carbon that they, they harness. They're pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and they, they pump the extra carbon into the ground through their root systems where uh, it's very stable. In the ground, it can be stable for thousands of, of years. But the plants we choose for our property are going to determine how well we do that. And our plant choices are going to determine whether we're harboring invasive plants, ecological tumors that don't stay on our property. They escape and they biologically pollute uh, all the land around us with a plant that does not support the local food web, pushing at the plants that do. So I tend to think of, of invasive plants as ecological tumors that, that castrate local ecosystem function. And they come from our properties, folks. <clears throat> and finally, plant choice is gonna determine whether uh, we are able to support the insects that then support the greater food web. In short, how we landscape is gonna help determine how much life earth can sustain. Uh, and that becomes an awesome responsibility that that uh, homeowners don't realize, that, that uh, agriculture doesn't realize. None of us seem to realize that we need to choose the right plants uh, or we're going to face ecosystem collapse. But it also creates a grassroots solution to the biodiversity crisis. And that's because most of the land is privately owned. 78% of the country is privately owned <clears throat> by over 100 million people. Uh, that's a big, that's a big army. 85.6% of the land east of the Mississippi. I live right over here. You guys are way over here, but these are common problems everywhere. A lot of people here though, on private property. So collectively it's private property owners uh, that now are the hope in the future of conservation. The big problem is they don't know that. They don't know that. Again, let's talk about lawn. Back to, to 44 million acres larger than an area the size of, of New England. Why do we do that? Well, lawn is, is a status symbol. Um, and we need to display our Halloween decorations. <clears throat> but what if we cut the area of lawn in half? Let's make the math simple. Let's say we've got 40 million acres of lawn. We cut that in half. That would give us 20 million acres that we could restore right where we live. It's enough area to create a new national park that I'm calling Homegrown National Park. And it will be big. It'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. You add up all the parks, all these major parks, and it's still less than 20 million acres. So Homegrown National Park be the biggest park in the country. I had this idea, <clears throat> well, I don't know. 2007, a long time ago, and I started putting it in my, my talks. Uh, it wasn't until I wrote Nature's Best Hope that I actually made a chapter out of Homegrown National Park. Uh, but recently, I've teamed up with uh, a woman, uh, Michelle Alfonderi, who is essentially a, a brand or a marketer who uh, is going to help me get this message out to all the people who don't know 
that they are the future of conservation. We created the small nonprofit, homegrownnationalpark.org. You can go to the website, register your property on the map, and the amount of area that you're going to be a good steward of. If you really are going to reduce your lawn, and I know some of this doesn't apply to the drier areas of the country, but then you put that area on, on the property. If you're going to protect a, a, a riparian area, a stream side that goes through your property, you put that area on on the map. <clears throat> if you if you put an aster in a flower pot, that's good enough. Then you're a member of Homegrown National Park. It's free, by the way. And the object is to get the message that everybody uh, is responsible for Earth stewardship. We want that message to go viral and have the entire country light up. What are we asking? We are asking people to reduce area across the country, the area of lawn, because lawn is not contributing ecologically to any of our ecological goals. We want to replace that lawn with more of the native plants that are contributing. We want to remove any invasive species that are on our properties. Most people uh, do have invasive plants on their, their properties. They don't know it, um, either as ornamentals or on the edges of their properties loaded with invasives. Remember, if 78% if of the country is, is privately owned and everybody got rid of the invasives on their private property, we'd be 78% done. And that would reduce the seed rain that's constantly reinfecting our, our areas. And then finally, if, if your property protects any natural area, um, any of your uh, remaining prairies, that's wonderful. You want to continue doing that. There are real ecological products associated with the concept of homegrown national park. Um, when we do this, there will be a significant increase in, in biodiversity. Uh, and I'll tell you what's happened at, at our house just to prove that that is the case. A measurable reduction in invasive species. If we all remove the invasive species from our properties, uh, we are more than halfway done. If we replant areas that are now in lawn um, with just about anything else, we're going to pull a lot more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. That will help climate change. Uh, and we're going to begin the process of creating those viable habitats outside of parks and preserves, changing them from no man's land to some place, to places where animals can live. Remember, every bit of conservation that happens outside of a park helps conservation inside of that park. There are also important sociological products associated with homegrown national park. National awareness is one of them, not just of what the problem is, but what the solutions are. We really are trying to change the culture. Uh, right now, we have an adversarial relationship with nature. We want to change that to a collaborative one. We want people to recognize that nature is not optional. It's not there just for our entertainment. It's something we all depend on. It's what runs the ecosystems that, that provide our life support. And because we all need that, we all have responsibility to sustaining the natural world. We want to convert hope into action. Hope is good, but action's better. And because we don't charge, we're not pulling memberships away from, from any other conservation organizations. So there's wonderful groups out there, Audubon, National Wildlife Federation, Wild Ones, um, Sierra Club, they're all over the place. What we wanna do is merge. We wanna get a record of all of these successful conservation efforts on the map so we can see how well we're really doing. If we don't record conservation on private property, and most people are not recording that, we have no idea the progress we're actually making. There's urgency to enacting, enacting the homegrown national park solution. Uh, and if we're just talking about residential uh, landscapes, it's because there's so many acres in those landscapes, 135 million acres in residential landscape. So it's a big job. We all need to cooperate and get to work to make those conversions. We can do it, but there are a few things we need to know uh, collectively. We need to learn if we're going to succeed. Uh, and here it is. There are four things that every landscape, four ecological responsibilities that every landscape shares, no matter where you are. Every landscape has to support a local food web. Every landscape has to, to sequester carbon to help climate change. Every landscape exists within a watershed, so um, have to manage that watershed responsibly. And every landscape has to support pollinators. We always talk about pollinators as we need them because of agriculture. Uh, they do help. You hear <clears throat> that every third bite you take uh, is, is uh, created by a pollinator. It's a little exaggeration. It's really about one twelfth of our, our uh, ag depends on, on pollinators. But 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants depends on pollinators. So uh, that's the real reason we need pollinators. We need them everywhere, not just next to agriculture. 
Lawn accomplishes none of those goals, folks. And that's why we talk about reducing the area of, of lawn. Um, Non-native plants uh, aren't accomplishing those goals uh, either. So plant choice, again, we've got to learn that plant choice matters. There are three kinds of plants out there and we have to pick the right ones. There are plants that contribute energy to local food webs, plants that do not contribute energy to local food webs and plants that remove energies from local food webs. What's the energy I'm talking about? Remember, plants are capturing energy from the sun. It comes from the sun and they're turning that energy into food. That's what photosynthesis does. It turns, it captures the energy from the sun and, and puts it in the carbon bonds of simple sugars and carbohydrates. And that's the food that supports all the animals on the planet with a few minor exceptions. Um, so you've got to get the plant, the energy from the plant to the animals or you don't have any animals. That's what contributors do. Non-contributors, uh, they create food, but they keep it in, in their tissues. They don't pass it on to local food webs. And again, detractors actually remove that energy. Best example of a uh, contributor and 84% of the counties in which they occur is one of the oaks. Uh, and again, you know, Eastern Washington's not one of the places I would go for oak diversity, uh, but around the country, oaks are the number one plant contributing more energy than any other plant genus. Good example of a non-contributor would be uh, ginkgo, ginkgo biloba from Asia, nice ornamental plant, any of the plants from, from Asia. Um, they're pretty, they're decorations, but nothing can eat a ginkgo. So it's not contributing any energy to a local food web. Uh, and any of our invasive ornamentals, bamboo is a great, great example, but we've got dozens of them um, that escape our plantings and move into natural areas, don't support the, the local food web and push out the plants that do. We need to appreciate how important caterpillars are in, in local food webs. Um, they're not worms, they're not just bugs. Turns out they are transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. So if we don't design landscapes that make a lot of caterpillars, we have failed food webs. Uh, therefore, keystone plants become essential because they're supporting the most caterpillars. Remember what a keystone is. It's the stone in the middle of the Roman arch. If you take that stone out of the arch, the arch collapses. Well, I call these plants keystone plants because they're making most of the food. Just 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food that drives the food web. So if you take these plants out, out of your local food web, the food web collapses. So think of the keystone plants in the ecological house that you're building uh, as the, the two by fours that hold that house up. They are the support system. You can't build a house out of wallpaper. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last century. How do you know what the best plants are where you live? You go to Native Plant Finder and the National Wildlife Federation website. You put in your zip code and the ranked list of the highest, uh, the, 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 the best contributors uh, in both woody plants and herbaceous plants will pop up for your county. And these are just uh, examples. Um, and the list is much longer than this too. I stopped because I ran out of room. So the old excuse that uh, we need that we don't know what plants to 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 put into our our the, those ecological houses we're building. That all excuse excuses out the window. This all you have to do is go to this website and it will tell you exactly what you should be planning. We also have to accept what E.O. Wilson told us way back in 1987. Insects are the little things that run the world. And if we lose our insects, we're going to lose us. We'd last about three months on the planet without insects. We've already lost more than 45% of the insects on the planet. So it's a, it's a very serious issue. And most of those insects, the insects that eat plants, are what we call host plant specialists. They can only eat particular plants. They can only eat the plants for which they have evolved very specialized adaptations that help them get around the plant defenses, which means our insects are only going to do well on native plants. They they have not been able to develop adaptations for plants that come from other continents. That's why native plants are so important. Monarch butterfly is a perfect example. Uh, we all know that monarchs uh, depend on milkweed. That is the only thing that's going to uh, allow them to uh, grow and develop. Milkweeds, of course, are toxic plants. They're protected by, by a compound called cardiac glycosides, which is why we don't eat milkweeds. If we eat milkweeds, our heart stops. It's a very effective defense. They're also protected by sticky latex sap. If you break open a milkweed leaf, all this goo comes out, but it gels on, on exposure to air. And if a caterpillar eats it, it glues its mouth parts together. Well, monarchs are good at getting around both 
of those, those uh, very important adaptations. They have physiological adaptations that, that get around the cardio, cardiac glycosides and behavioral adaptations that block the flow of that sticky latex sap. And that's why they can eat uh, milkweeds when most other plants can't. Finally, it has to become common knowledge that we really do need pollinators. And again, not just for agriculture. You know, here people say, well, I don't live next to a farm, so I don't need any pollinators. You do because 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants are pollinated by animals, pollinators. If we lose our pollinators, we lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. And that's not an option, folks. We wanna appreciate the ecological value of fallen leaves. You know, forever we just rake them up, we put them in a bag or we burn them or we, we, we get rid of them. Uh, but these are forming, performing essential ecological roles on our landscapes. First of all, um, th when they're broken down by the creatures that live in the soil, and by the way, there are more species that live in the soil than above the soil, you're returning the nutrients that is in those leaves to the ground so that the plants that made those leaves can use it again. When we rake our leaves away, we're throwing away those nutrients. And when you do that decade after decade, then we, we shouldn't wonder why our trees don't live as long as they should. Leaf litter protects the moisture in the soil. Our soil community, including the mycorrhizae that help our plants requires high levels of moisture uh, and, and bare soil doesn't retain it. So leaf litter becomes extremely valuable. Now, a lot of people will say, well, I can't grow my, my, my garden plants. I can't landscape well if I keep my leaves around. And that's, that's simply not true. Our plants are very good at getting growing right through uh, normal layers of, of leaf litter. Um, this is golden seal, very good at doing that. And dozens of examples of ornamental plants and ground covers that do really well in leaf litter. Light pollution is one of the major causes of insect decline. Uh, and we got a lot of lights out there. We can turn them out. We can put motion sensors on those, those lights uh, so that they only come on when the bad man comes. But the easiest thing to do is take the white bulb out of our security lights and put in a yellow bulb because yellow wavelengths are far less attractive to nocturnal insects, particularly those moths that make the caterpillars that run our food webs, than blue or white wavelengths. So you can get yellow incandescent or yellow LED. Uh, if we were to switch out our white bulbs with yellow bulbs overnight, we would save millions of insects. And if we use LEDs, we'd save millions of dollars as well. I want to appreciate the value of, of small properties. 82% of us live in cities. Uh, and a lot of them say, well, I can't, I can't help with conservation because I live in a city. Um, this, this property here is, is one-tenth of an acre. It's Pam Carlson's property in the middle of Chicago. One-tenth of an acre is three times smaller than the average lot size in, in North America. And she has recorded, uh, what, 124 species on her property because she's uh, removed the non-native plants and put in native plants. Uh, and if you don't have any ground at all, you live in an apartment or you, you just, I mean, it's all paved over. Container gardening is the way to go. We can get plants back into our urban landscapes by putting the important plants that are particularly our pollinators need in containers. Remember, bees, the monarch, everything else is, is uh, very mobile. And even if you're on the 10th floor of an apartment complex, but you put these plants on your, your porch, um, you will you'll provide resources for many of those, those native bees. Now, fortunately, we do have a silver bullet in our fight against climate change and biodiversity crisis. We can fight both of these, these global crises at the same time. And that is that conservation works and conservation starts with the proper plants. Just a few examples. Here's the Natchusa grasslands. It, it is 3,800 acres. It's in, in Illinois, 730 native plant species there. 180 species of birds reside there, and it used to be a cornfield. Nature's resilient. If we put the plants back, then the animals come back as well. This is my house, our house. Uh, this is where my wife, Cindy, and I live in Oxford, Pennsylvania. It was part of a farm broken up into 10-acre lots, mowed for hay before we moved in. When you mow for hay in Southeast Pennsylvania, it's not going for animals, it's going to the mushroom industry. So they really just mow anything that grows there, which is mostly the invasive plants from Asia. Multiflora rose and oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and, and uh, bush honeysuckle and privet and calorie pear 
you mow it over and over again. And when you stop mowing, this is what comes back. And of course, when we build our house, they stopped mowing three years before we actually moved in. The entire 10 acres looked like that. Uh, so a lot of people want to give up at that point because it's a lot of work to get rid of it. The way to get rid of it is to marry somebody like Cindy because she got rid of it for us. Uh, it's, it is a lot of work, but it is doable. Um, she pretty much cleared the property. You have to stay on it when your neighbors don't do the same thing because the, the uh, seeds, seed rain continues and, and the little guys come back. But once you get rid of the big guys, the little guys are much easier to control. And then we started to put the plants back. This is what the property looks like today, taken from the same, same position. I've been counting the number of species of moths that now make a living at, at our house because our research has shown that if you know the number of species of moths, not butterflies, but moths, in your local food web, you have a very good index, an accurate index of how productive that food web is. In other words, how many species it can support and how stable it is. I've been doing it for five years. I'm up to 1,199 species of moths recorded so far. I'm not done because every time I go out, I find new, new species. And a lot of them are, are beautiful creatures like the chinkapin leaf miner, the skullcap skeletonizer, the neighbor, the little devil, they have great names too. The horrid zaley, the scallop sallow, the obtuse yellow, the explicit arches, the snowy shouldered eclaris, the grateful midget, the pink shaded fern moth, the scribbler, the lemon plagotis, the showy emerald, the green marvel, Harris's three spot, the bride, the eyed pectes, the tufted bird dropping moth. Who wouldn't want the tuft tufted bird dropping moth on their property? This is my favorite, the spun glass caterpillar. Uh, talk about exquisite uh, examples of nature. And hundreds of other species have come back to the, the, uh, our property because we put the plants back. Unless you think it's only pretty moths that are in, in the east, uh, here's some moths from, from the west. Uh, none of these guys have common names. and You, want, you don't want to want to know the, the scientific names, but um, some of them really are, are quite exquisite. So you've got wonderful moths out there too. And I hope you can start appreciating them. They're running the food web, by the way. Uh, and speaking of, of uh, moths, they, of course, reproduce by making caterpillars. Uh, and they eat the plants. And people say, well, you've got all these caterpillars eating the plants. What's going to keep your property from being defoliated? And what's going to keep the property from being defoliated is all the creatures that eat those caterpillars. And it's a lot of things. It is a lot of things. 61 species of birds now breed on our property because of all those species of moths that, that we have, have provided the food for. We also have uh, other predators, insect predators. This is the ambush bug. We've got assassin bugs. We've got predatory stink bugs. This guy sat next to this aggregation of milkweed caterpillars and he ate one a day. It's like a vitamin. And pretty soon the, that aggregation was much smaller. We've got parasitic wasps, parasitoids, uh, a lot of species of parasitoids, and they're all hitting those caterpillars. We've got predatory wasps that are stinging the caterpillars and taking them back to the nest. And, and that's what their, their larvae eat. And we've got vertebrates that are eating uh, all of those, those insects as well, like skunks, like possums, like raccoons, <clears throat> like foxes. 25% of a red fox's diet is insects. 23% of a black bear's diet is insects, by the way. Uh, and we've got amphibians. This is the uh, one of the tree frogs. We've got toads. We've got salamanders. We've got ringneck snakes. They're all eating insects. And we have the cutest little gray tree frogs, which are actually green when they're, they're young, all on our property, eating all of those insects. We don't have any defoliation issues. So we talked about lawn, but lawn, if that's our only goal, it's too modest because most of our privately owned land is in small woodlands, it's in cropland, and it's in rangeland. Let's talk briefly about small woodlands. I know you don't have a lot of these in, in uh, Washington, Eastern Washington, but around the, the country, there's a lot, 406 million acres of woodlots managed by private citizens, not by logging companies in the US. That is a lot. And how those woodlots are managed is gonna determine the amount of biodiversity that can be sustained in those woodlots. Um, of course, many of those woodlots are, are functional. The, they're being logged. 
but how you log them is important too. Uh, and there's there's uh, organizations like the Foundation for Sustainable Forests that are teaching us that you can log a forest forever if you log it sustainably. There's two kinds of, of logging out there. Um, high grade harvesting where you take the best trees, uh, it's kind of like a clear cut or worse first, uh, forest management where you take the the um, declining or or poor trees. High grade harvesting gives you a great harvest once and then it's done. Worst first selection with smaller, more frequent harvests leads to higher yields that can continue in, indefinitely. So obviously for sustainability, this is the way we want to go. We also have to manage the invasive plants that are in those woodlots. Uh, and and the, where you get more areas of rain, you certainly have more um, issues with invasive plants. Um, but in so many of our woodlots and our natural areas, a third of the vegetation is from someplace else, typically from Asia. You're looking at a, a park. This is White Clay Creek State Park uh, near my house. Uh, I took this picture in March when all the plants from Asia leaf out before the plants from North America. So every bit of green you see in this park here is a plant from, from China, not supporting the local food web. Uh, why do we have such a uh, problem with invasive plants? Are really all these non-native plants so much better competitors than our native plants? No, they're not. But these guys tip the competitive balance. We have way too many deer, folks. We've got deer that are many times over the carrying capacity, uh, and they don't eat our native our, our non-native plants. They don't eat the invasive plants. They eat the native plants. So as soon as a baby oak tree pops its head above the ground, these guys eat it. They won't touch the, the barberry. They won't touch the burning bush. They won't touch the oriental bittersweet or the privet. Uh, so of course, those plants take over. We've got to control deer. We've got Lyme disease because we've got too many deer. Uh, we have no regeneration in our, our forests because they are eating all the understory. This is what a healthy understory looks like. I took this in the Great Smoky Mountains just a few weeks ago. Um, they do have deer, but they don't have too many deer because they also have predators. They've got a lot of black bear. They've got bobcats. They've got coyotes. <clears throat> they don't have wolves anymore, and they don't have, have cougars anymore. But still, it's enough to keep those deer in check, and you have a healthy ecosystem. Cropland. Let's talk about cropland. You guys know about cropland. We've got 410 million acres uh, of cropland, and I guess you, you're over here. Um, and there's a lot of things we can do on cropland. Of course, we need cropland. We're not going to get rid of cropland, but there are at least four things we can do to increase biodiversity in our, our cropland. Uh, managing roadsides, uh, thinking about hedgerows again, putting in prairie strips, and minimizing unnecessary uh, insecticide use. Um, this, this is the, the agricultural ethic, at least through uh, much of the corn and soybean belts, right east, wherever people are growing this, they've taken away the, the native plants that used to be on the edges of these, these fields and replaced them with, with lawn. And that's been enabled because of Roundup Ready corn and soybeans. So the grower could spray right up to the road. Uh, and this is now the high status uh, farmer. He's... he's um, I don't know. It's a status symbol. That's, a, that's all I can say. But that is the cause of the uh, decline of the monarch butterfly, which is now red listed, uh, because that's where everything it needed grew. That's where the milkweed grew. That's where the, the uh, asters and, and goldenrod uh, that the monarch needs for its, its um, you know, magnificent migration from Canada all the way down to, to Mexico. It's also where uh, you know many of the 4,000 species of native bees made their living. It's all gone at this point. Whenever you go, this is what you see, but we're starting to put it back. Iowa is actually leading the way. Uh, I just saw a figure, pretty old figure, but they restored over 50, 52,000 acres of, of roadside with the prairie plants that used to be there. We can do that everywhere. Um, hedgerows, I know we remove hedgerows so that it makes it easy for the large farm machinery, but wherever we can put them back, um, they are a valuable source of biodiversity if they are filled with native plants. Hedgerows filled with non-native plants are not going to not going to help at all. Um, just to emphasize that point, we did a, a study in hedgerows in Maryland, Pennsylvania, and Delaware, where we compared caterpillar communities and hedgerows that are invaded by non-native plants. This is autumn olive and multiflora rose and all those other guys, and compared the caterpillar population in hedgerows that are not invaded. 
And we found a 68% reduction in the number of species in the invaded hedgerows, a 91% reduction in the abundance of those species and a 96% reduction in the biomass, the actual weight of those, those caterpillars. This is the amount of energy that's there. And if we don't say caterpillars, if we say bird food, you've taken away 96% of the bird food when you allow hedgerows to get invaded with non-native plants or when you remove the hedgerow altogether. We don't have to wonder why we've lost uh, 3 billion breeding birds in the last 50 years. We've taken away much of what they can eat. Adding prairie strips to our agriculture. Um, extremely valuable. Again, a lot of research in Iowa uh, about how to do this and all the benefits uh, of doing it. Of course, you're providing a lot of opportunity for pollinators. What you do is you plant these right through the fields perpendicular to the flow of water off the cropland. That supports pollinators, of course, but it also reduces topsoil loss by 95% because it intercepts any, any uh, topsoil that's trying to escape. It reduces water pollution by 90% because it intercepts any of the, the nutrients that are, are put on. Um, so it's a little bit of loss of, of, of uh, productive land, but there's cost sharing opportunities from uh, USDA CREP programs. So it should be a win-win for everybody. Then finally, unnecessary neonicotinoid seed coatings. Um, I don't know if, if wheat has these seed coatings, but um, they're not necessary, folks. They're 7,000 times more toxic to insects than DDT was. Uh, they're used preventively. So you use them whether you have an insect problem or not. Uh, and studies have shown that, that comparing fields where, excuse me, where you, you have uh, seed coatings and fields where you don't, there's no difference in yield. So we're doing it essentially for, for nothing. Only 5% of the product is taken up by the plants. The other 95% washes off into the watershed or blows away on the dust. And we're just starting to learn how, how uh, detrimental that is to insect populations. Uh, rangeland, I know you don't have a lot of rangeland uh, uh, either in, in Washington, but there's a lot of rangeland around the country, 707 million acres, four and a half times the size of Texas dedicated to rangeland, to cattle. Uh, but how it's grazed is critically important in terms of whether it's going to be a functional ecosystem or not. Our grasslands, our meadows, our prairies, everywhere, not just in the U.S., but around the world, co-evolved with grazers. They were always grazed. So having them grazed by bison or cattle is a natural thing. The degree to which they are grazed will determine whether it, they're going to be diverse ecosystems. This is a, an experimental range in Nebraska that uh, Cindy and I visited these are all sunflowers here. All the birds were there. These are cows. They're not, not uh, bison, but uh, they were experimenting with different levels of, of grazing. And it was a really diverse place. The most destructive thing that uh, is happening on rageland is allowing the, the cows to, to eat all the vegetation along the stream sides and get in and trample the stream beds. Um, so you lose the cottonwoods, you lose the, the willows, and that is supporting an incredible amount of, of biodiversity uh, in our, our drier uh, rangelands. So uh, rangeland or, or wheat fields, please protect your riparian carters uh, because that is where the biodiversity resides. Put those willows and cottonwoods back uh, and you will bring an awful lot of life back to your, to your property. Okay, there's something that's common to each one of these conservation approaches uh, and that's whether or not they succeed depends on decisions that you and I make. These become people problems. One of my students wrote this in, a, in a, an exam last year. She said, while conservationists claim to be managing species and habitats, what we're really managing is people. Uh, and that is so true. It's people that are gonna decide whether this works or not. We are talking about changing our culture from that adversarial approach where you know it's us against nature uh, to a collaborative one. If we don't work together, we're not gonna persist on this planet. So it really is, serious stuff. And a lot of people wonder whether we can do this. I think we can. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to save biodiversity for a living, but you really can save it where you live or where you work or help save it uh, where, where you farm. Um, and if you do, it empowers you. A lot of people wonder, what can one person do? Well, one person can shrink the lawn, one person can modify their lights, one person can add a pollinator garden, one person can remove invasives from their property, one can, person can add Keystone plants, one person can fire their mosquito fogger. We didn't talk about that, but around the country, it's a booming business. 
And these guys are killing all the insects that are out there and not controlling mosquitoes. One person can join Homegrown National Park. One person can totally revitalize the ecosystem where they live and then contribute to the greater ecosystem instead of continuing to degrade it. It also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problems. You, you just get depressed doing that. Just worry about the piece of the planet that you can influence. Uh, if you own property, it's obvious that's where you start. If you don't own property, help somebody who does. Help a land conservancy, help a park or preserve. They're all underfunded. They're all understaffed. They will love you as a volunteer. So we hope that, that uh, Homegrown National Park, uh, any of the ideas that we provide, uh, will motivate you and guide you uh, to tackle these conservation challenges. They are the challenges of our time. And whether or not we, we address them is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own. So thanks very much. Happy to take questions now. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Doug. This was such a great presentation. So many good catchphrases to bring out of this, which is awesome. We always need more catchphrases in conservation. Um, so as a reminder, you're welcome to put any questions into the chat. If you would like to um, unmute yourself and ask them directly, you are also more than welcome to. Uh, we have a number of questions that came in, but I actually wanted to uh, just follow up and say, um, you know, if you're feeling inspired and, you know, you're doing conservation or you want to do conservation on your property, reach out to your conservation district. Uh, if you, whether that's us at the Palouse Conservation District or whoever is, you know, in your neighborhood, but we can definitely help with financial and technical assistance. Um, and one program that we use here in Washington States is uh, to capture voluntary stewardship on the landscape through the Voluntary Stewardship Program. Um, this is a locally driven pro program that uh, protects critical areas and it also maintains and enhances the viability of agriculture. So um, check out what your neighbors are doing on the VSP website, which Jody is putting into the chat right now. Um, and you're also welcome to put your own conservation actions on that website. But with that, I'm gonna get started with some questions here. Uh, the first one we received, is there a way that we can tell whether plants from a nursery have been treated with pesticides before purchase? Well, not by looking at it. You have to trust your, your nurseryman. You can ask them, you know, are these treated plants? Um, if they say yes, you know they're being honest. You know, not all plants are treated. You can easily grow plants outside without treating them. Greenhouse plants, it's a bigger challenge because there are serious greenhouse pests there. Um, the good news is that the the pesticides they're treated with don't last forever. The plants can grow out of them. But some of them, the, the neonics, for example, are systemic. And in woody plants, they can last years. So you have to be careful about that. If you're actually buying uh, milkweeds for, for monarchs, you really want to make sure that they're not treated because they will kill the monarchs you're trying to save. Um, you know, and now years down the road, they'll grow out of it. But um, it's an important piece of information. Uh, and and if the, I feel sorry for for a lot of nursery growers because they're they're really caught. Sometimes it's very difficult to grow these plants without pesticides. It'd be much better. We've got to get away from the systemics that last for years, uh, and and just deal with with uh, some of the immediate pest problems that we we have um, without those systemics, so that you can buy a plant. And you know, once you get it out in nature, the the natural. Uh, predators and parasitoids take care of things. So, you know, if you buy a plant, it's got a few aphids on it. It's okay. Put it out. Something will eat those, those aphids. But no, you can't walk up and look at a plant and know whether it's, it's been treated or not. Good to know. Thank you. Um, so it's, you know, starting to warm up here in Washington. I hear people outside working in their yards. Is there a certain date or a certain temperature at which it's safe? It's okay to clean up those leaves and garden trimmings or, you know, well, how can we best protect those overwintering insects? No, <laughs> because insects emerge. They don't all emerge in the spring. They come out on a schedule. Remember that evening primrose moth I showed you at our house? That comes out as an adult that emerges from its overwintering uh, pupa in July. Um, now, there are things that come out in, in the spring, but um, they come out in a regular sequence right into September. And then there's a series of what we call winter moths that don't, don't even emerge till the end of October, early November. And then they spend the winter as, as adults, believe it or not. 
So it is much better to um, try to manage your property in ways knowing that whatever you do is going to impact what you're doing it to. So if you have a, a meadow, for example, or a prairie, and you're trying to manage that and occasionally you have to burn it or mow it, you do a third, a third, a third. So that anyone, when any one section is only treated once every three years. Um, that way there's two thirds that are untreated and that's where the insects that will recolonize the third that had to be treated will come from. Um, that's the best advice. If you have a much smaller area, um, you know, if you're if you're trying to manage for for native bees in your your little pocket prairie, uh, cut the plants back in March, say, but leave them only cut them back about 15 inches off the ground, uh, because it is the stems that are remaining there from the previous year's growth that is where the native bees are going to nest this coming coming season. If you cut them down to the ground, you've eliminated uh, the nesting sites for any of those those pith uh, nesting bees. And there's a lot of them. Uh, and then the plant soon grows up past those dead stems. You don't even see them any anymore. So it is, it is more sightly. Don't do that in the fall because those plants all have seeds on them and the seed heads. And that's what your, your sparrows and other overwinning birds are eating all winter long. That's very good to know. Thank you. Um, so you you talk a lot about you know removing lawn and lawn is not very ecologically productive. Uh, how do we encourage this shift of taking away the lawns in our neighborhoods and and is is regulation an appropriate approach to that? Um, top down regulation uh, is an approach, but you know everybody hates that. Nobody wants to be told what to do. It's much better to do it uh, from the ground up. Uh, one thing you can do for your neighborhood is you do it and be a great example, be a motivating example, show people that you can actually manage your, your yard uh, in an ecologically productive way and not lower property values. It's not going to be a mess. Now, I say reduce the area of lawn. I don't say get rid of it because lawn is a cue for care. Uh, so you you have a strip of lawn along your driveway, your sidewalk or, or around your, your the beds that you've added to your your yard. It's manicured, it's mowed, and it shows people that you understand what the, the standard is for the neighborhood. You're part of it. You know, you're not a renegade trying to wreck everything. You just have more plants in, in your yard. You can do that without anybody even noticing it. Um, it's when you, when you stop mowing all together and just let it all go into what people call weeds, that's when they start to get upset. Doesn't mean you can't have a meadow or something like that, but but at least in the beginning, maybe the backyard is a better place for the meadow rather than, than the front yard. But if you have a little, we call them pocket prairies, but small areas with the lawn around it, it's obvious that this is planned uh, and that you're, you're still being a good steward of the property. Fantastic, thank you. Um, some restorers advocate uh, or use glyphosate to kill or remove invasive vegetation prior to planting natives. How harmful is this for a one-time use? Not nearly as harmful as people say it is. You know, the people who've been getting sick from glyphosate, they've been, they're professional sprayers who've been doing it their entire life. Much of them, many of them doing it without proper gear or, or instruction. So um, herbicides are a valuable tool in our control of invasives. They can be misused. They can be overused. I don't personally like to spray because you always hit non-targets. But I do for woody invasives, I cut them at the base and, and paint the, the trunk. Um, I'll tell you what works really well, though, unless you're talking about acres and acres and acres, is a matting. And what a matting is like a big pick with a fat end, uh, a, a blade at one end. And you swing that matting, you can, you can take out 10-foot autumn olives or, or Russian olives and a number of other things, all those blackberries uh, that are in the West. It's a great tool for eliminating that stuff without any herbicides at all. There are also little handheld mat mattocks, which are great for, for uh, getting the, the things that root very closely, like um, English ivy, you know, certainly all over, all over the West. Um, so you can do a lot of invasive removing without herbicides, but it is a very valuable tool, and I have used them. Great. Thank you. Um... A lot of nurseries in our area sell what they call nearly native species that are cultivars designed to be hardier or showier or otherwise better suited to the environment. Um, for example, cultivated lupin instead of our native lupin is very common here. Um, do these cultivars still support insect life? 
Yeah, it's a complicated question because nearly native is also referring to plants being moved up from the south for, for climate change. So the nearly meaning they are almost in your area, but not quite. If you're talking about cultivars, yeah, are cultivars as, as ecologically productive as the straight species? And the answer is it depends on what the cultivar trait is that has created the cultivar. A cultivar is a genetic variant of the straight species. And that change in the, the genome enhances a particular trait. A variety is a genetic variant that was created by nature. We bring it in, we put a name on it, and people just call them cultivars. But nature created it, and those are certainly as productive as, as other things that nature created. Um, we did a study at, with woody plants, looking at six different common cultivar traits. So whether you take it, when you take a tall plant and you make it short, whether you, when you change a green leaf to red or purple, that's a very common cultivar trait. When you enhance berry size, when you in, introduce disease resistance, things like that. Um, and the only trait that impacted insect use was taking a green leaf and making it red or purple because that loads the leaf with anthocyanins, which are feeding deterrents. Um, the other traits didn't, didn't matter. Now, we didn't look at, at uh, flowers. Most cultivars do change something about the flower. Uh, and there, the, the, the news is not as good um, because when you change a particular flower, you're probably messing up the relationship with the specialist bees that are associated with that flower. We've got generalist bees and we've got specialist bees, but the specialist bees and a third of our 4,000 species of native bees can only reproduce on the pollen of particular plants. Those are the specialist bees. Um, they're specialized to go to the plant because it looks like what they specialize on. It smells like what they specialize on. It's got the nutrition they need. It has a UV spectrum that we can't even see that they're tuned into. And when we start fooling with flower size and shape, when we make an echinacea, it looks like, look like a zinnia. When we make a double flower, then you're eliminating all of the nectar and pollen resources. Um, but it's not universal. So it's, it is possible to, to have a cultivar that actually has more nectar than uh, a, a straight species. So uh, again, it depends. If you're trying to figure out whether the plant that you bought is gonna be good for pollinators, you can just try it yourself, see whether they come. It's great if you can get the straight species because you know that works and then you can compare. What I would love to see is nurseries start to carry more straight species and let the market work it out. So in the past, you know, nobody would buy the straight species. They always wanted the fanciest one. And it's been a long time that that has been the case. So it's hard to convince nursery growers that there's actually a market out there. But there is a market out there now. The demand for straight species native plants exceeds the supply quite a bit right now. And that's a business opportunity. So more and more nurseries are actually following up on that. You can encourage that. By going to your nursery and asking for a particular plant, and if you want a straight species, say, I want straight species. And they say, well, we don't have that. I say, well, can you get it for me? And they might say, no. Then leave. Don't buy something else because that just encourages the production of the things that you don't want. Everybody should be able to get the, the plants they want for restoration as well as for aesthetics. But right now it's, it's all aesthetics and, and we need to work on that. Great, thank you. Uh, I see a heart from Judy. It's a great message. Um, how do we support ground nesting bees on our property? Well, it's pretty easy. All you need is ground. A slight southern slope uh, is is good. And a lot of people say that that you need you know sandy loam um, for them to dig in. But there are actually bees that they'll go right into the hardest clay. Um, they can go into just about any any type of soil. Uh, but what you need to do is, you know, no, no lawn care companies, no spraying of herbicides or pesticides on the ground and, and make it a no-go zone. You don't want to be walking on it either. These bees tunnel into the ground and they're coming up uh, out of it all the time. And it's very easy to crush their, their little tunnels when we, when we walk on them. So if you actually see a patch where you know that, that bees are, are nesting, maybe put a little rope around or something to keep people away from there. And that includes your pets, by the way. Um, how do you get them to start? They, they do like bare ground. Uh, so I, you know, I always say bare ground is an ecological no-no, but for little sections and, and perfect places where it gets warm in the spring in particular, because uh, it's got a south slope, 
Um, you can put those aside and see if the, the beast, beast will start. You, you know, train tr uh, tracks that are sloped on either side, they're, the bees love those, those slopes if it's the appropriate di direction. Uh, so try to mimic that and, and you ought to be able to get them. But you also have to, the bees aren't going to be there if there's nothing to eat. You've got to provide the forage that they need. And that's the hardest thing with, with native bees because they need forage. You've got a sequence of species on your property and they need forage from uh, where you guys are, I would say from uh, early March right through the end of October. In other words, you need blooming plants that long. That's hard. So some, not every species needs them that long, but you want that whole full sequence. And that's the hardest thing in keeping these bees around. But it's not hard if you've got your, your prairie plants because you've got so many species there and they're providing forage uh, for an awful long time. Don't forget the woody plants though. You know, willows are one of the first things to bloom. They're great for this early season uh, bloomers. Your Western red bud, you want to look for the things that are blooming uh, very early because the all the bumblebees that come out, it's the queen who's got to do all the foraging herself uh, and before she even creates the, the workers. That's what you want to make uh, easy for them. So you've got to provide those early spring blooming plants. Great. Thank you. Um, let's see, we have some other questions. Uh, so you, you mentioned that um, we need more than just habitat corridors. We need habitat within habitat. Um, we will have it that. that's right. <laughs> yeah, uh, is, is the Rails to Trails program, has that been successful in restoring and connecting insect habitat or are there other programs like that that are around or? or yeah, there's people doing it all over the place. They're all gonna be more successful than it was before they started. In most cases, nobody studied the, the impact. The biggest impact or the biggest problem with the rails, trails, rails to trails is the invasive plants. You know, I've seen these things and they're like 90% invasive plants and that's not going to help very much. But establishing the idea, establishing the, 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 you know, the area, getting it protected and then work on those, the plant conversion, controlling those invasives. Uh, is that's the job we've cut out for ourselves by selling invasive plants in our, our nurseries for a hundred years. We've created a huge problem. It's here, but we can't ignore it. Remember, there's hundreds of millions of us. We can do it, but um, but to to say, well, they're all they're all great and they're working perfectly. Nobody's nobody's measured that. It's really hard to measure that. You have to know what you started with. You have to measure it for several years because insect populations really fluctuate. But it's certainly a good idea to do it. Great, thank you. Um, and we did receive a question uh, when we talked about the voluntary stewardship program here in Washington, and someone said, "Well, that's great. What about Lata County?" Which, for your fear reference, Doug, that's that's in Idaho here. Um, so we did a little research, and it, you know, the voluntary stewardship program is specific to Washington State. But if you own land in Idaho, try reaching out to the Idaho Soil and Water Conservation Commission. Um, they're working on an Idaho conservation project tracker that you might be able to do on, on the Idaho side. So just wanted to give a shout out to that for our Idaho folks on the, on the call tonight. Um, Sheila asked, there is a lot of leave the dandelions this time of year. Should we? And should we be doing no mow May? <laughs> Let's start with no mow May. Um, if you have a lawn, uh, the way the lawn companies want you to have a lawn, lawn there's nothing but grass there. Right, they, when you buy fertilizer, there's typically a broadleaf herbicide in it, and it kills your dandelions, it kills your clover, and all you have is pure grass. If you stop mowing that, you're going to have tall grass instead of short grass, which doesn't provide any pollen or nectar for for pollinators. So, so that that just doesn't make sense. You've got to have the the broadleaf plants that actually flower to help pollinators. The concept of no mow may, in that we want to help pollinators. That's a great concept. We do want to help pollinators, but helping them for one month is not going to help them at all. Uh, so, so it's it's kind of like uh, bait and switch. You you say, yeah, look at all this wonderful forage here for a month, and then and in June you're going to mow it down and remove it. So any of the the ground nesting bees or the the pithy, pithy stem nesters, they've got their their babies starting, and then you remove all the pollen so they can't complete it. That seems cruel to me. It is much better 
to have no mow zones, areas that you never mow, and actually replace the grass with the blooming plants that will really help the pollinators. So I love the idea of everybody trying to help pollinators, but no mow may, I think people want to do it because it's fun to say, not because it's actually anything that's going to help. Great, thank you. Um, so, you know, thinking about agricultural systems like what we have here on the Palouse, um, how much of the landscape should we be devoting to biodiversity? <laughs> uh, well, you know, that that is a tough question. When you're talking about, you're the top wheat producer. Mm -hmm. So you have to say of the entire country, mm -hmm. uh, then you want to look at how much area in the entire country are we going to put aside for biodiversity so that we have food for humans and biodiversity. We can do both. It's hard to do both in all places. Uh, if you're the best place for growing wheat, you probably want to grow wheat there uh, and, and hope that some other places that are lousy for wheat and other things are going to do better at bio, biodiversity. I would love to see you do as much as you can to enhance the biodiversity in the areas where you are, are growing wheat. But we do have 8 billion people on this planet. We all want to eat. Um, so eliminating agriculture or even reducing it at this point, until we address the, the human population issue, which is another whole seminar, uh, we have to grow the wheat. So, so, so I, you know, I don't know. Whatever you can do to get to get uh, native plants in and around that that wheat, that will help. Just think of it that way. Great, thank you. Um, and we had an interesting question as well. A lot of the places around here that have good potential for Wildlife corridors are also high potential sites for wind or solar farms. Um, mm -hmm. Is there a middle ground or is there a way to safely implement both of these things at the same time? There's actually pretty good research with, with solar farms and um, meadow prairie plants in and among them, uh, at least in the east. I haven't seen it in the west, but uh, I've seen some, some really productive uh, sites just loaded with, with uh, flowers. Uh, and, and, you know, very successful meadow plantings right in amongst the solar arrays. So I think that's that's quite possible to uh, have both at the same place. Uh, the, the wind turbines, I just don't know enough about it. They're off, they're high in the air. You ought to be able to have prairie plants under them as well. Um, you know, we've got issues with, with bat collisions and bird collisions, and you want to site them in areas that are not major migratory routes. Um, but I, I, I don't see why we can't do both. I really don't. Um, it's the same issue. We need renewable energy. We absolutely need it. So to eliminate solar and wind, not, you know, not really an option right now. That makes sense. Yeah. I, hopefully it, that sounds great to be able to do both. So hopefully we can continue that, that direction. Um, and then can you, you know, in your research and what you've seen, how, how are, what are the ways that we can incentivize private landowners to restore biodiversity on their property. So what financial assistance, what technical assistance is out there? We could find, we could uh, motivate them, incentivize them overnight by changing the tax structure. And, and there's forms of that, uh, you know, in, in uh, actually the incentives work much better than, than uh, any type of, of punishment. But of course, in, in California, you get a $3 per square foot rebate for every square foot of lawn you remove and put in Xeric planning. Uh, people are taking advantage of that. There are cost sharing programs around the country to reduce lawns, one in Minnesota, one in, in Pennsylvania, uh, where the state will help you help pay for, for that. That's that's an incentive. Um, there's an island off of, of uh, Florida that's paying people to allow burrowing owls to burrow in the front yard, uh, which I think is the way the Endangered Species Act should be rewritten so that you, if you have an endangered species on your property, we're going to pay you to take care of it. Uh, and, and everybody would want an endangered species because it'd be a form of, of uh, making money. You know, it doesn't have to be a lot. In Costa Rica, they changed the, the tax structure. Costa Rica, of course, the number one industry now is, is ecotourism. Used to be bananas, but now it's ecotourism. And they have wonderful parks and preserves, but in between those parks and preserves, they leveled the country. It was 80% forested and they took away more than half of the forest. And they said, uh-oh, not a good idea. So 
well, it was at least 20 years ago, they changed the tax structure and said, if you put the forest back on your property, we're going to pay you to do that. Right away, it started to rebuild. So the last I saw is they were up to like 55% forested now. They're, they're really restoring the country. It's helping the coral reefs off the, the you know coast. Uh, so there's no more, you know, uh, all the silt washing down by a simple change in tax structure. Nobody's getting rich off of it, uh, but it's supporting the number one industry in the country. Uh, and what it does is it makes it socially acceptable. If you want to do the right thing and the government's paying you to do it and your neighbor says, oh, I don't like those weeds. So, hey, I'm, you know, I'm the good guy here. I'm I'm getting paid to do this. Um, it, it It will make it socially acceptable to follow these these uh, things. So just a very slight tax structure change where you actually get paid for reducing the amount of lawn you have or something, that would change it overnight. Great, thank you. Um, and Kylie says they are a student at Washington State University entomology and bio major. Um, and they see uh, mowers over the dandelions on campus. Um, they said all the sheds of the lawn from the lawnmower, but the dandelions are still there. Does this reduce attraction from dandelions? And Kylie, I'm not sure if you're talking about attraction to the for the insects or if you if you want to unmute, you're more than welcome to. But Doug, like, the, the insects, yeah. I just wonder because I still see like lawn over them. Like, right. It just makes me wonder. You know, when you mow something, a blooming plant uh, over and over again, it starts to bloom much shorter. Um, so a plant that will bloom when it's three feet tall, like I have them in my driveway. Uh, they'll bloom when they're two inches tall. It's an adaptation that that will happen. So you start to get the dandelions blooming very, very short. Um, the, the, you know, the insects will still go to them. Dandelions are not number one in terms of supporting your pollinators. Uh, clover is much, much better. Clover actually fertilizes the grass uh, and provides a lot of forage for the at least generalist bees. Um, and it's, you know, when I grew up, all the lawns had clover in it. It was the norm. Uh, and dandelions are, are um, they're kind of a, a hair trigger. The neighbor who doesn't, who wants the perfect lawn, it's first thing they're going to complain about is your dandelions. So, and since they, they don't support all that much, um, I would focus on clover and and not dandelions. Great, thank you. Um, well, I think, so Kylie said, I wish I would see clover on the lawns here. Yep, we have a lot of dandelions. They're all out in full bloom right now. Lawns of yellow. <laughs> hey, you can eat dandelion, eat the dandelion mm -hmm. leaves. <laughs> Definitely, yes. Um, well, I think that's all the questions that we have tonight. Um, so thank you so much for staying with us and answering all of these questions. It was very informative. You're welcome. I'll have to get out to the Palouse Prairie and see what it looks like one of these days. <laughs> <laughs>